we're on chapter 19. And remember, she's at, um, she's trying to meet Hector at the roller skating at the pier, but um, she's just run into uh, Florence Fuswell, which I said, I'm not sure why she's excited that she ran into her because that's, she accused her brother of murder. So let's see, a new motive. Well, if it isn't the world famous eyewitness, said Florence, or shall we say the meddling fabricator, Charlotte's gaze sharpened so swiftly, I'd swear her eyelashes trembled. I did my best to smile, perilous, perilously situated between Florence Fuswell and Constable Beck, each heavily armed troublemakers. Charlotte had departed from the breakfast table before the discussion of Mr. Fibley's interview and did not usually read the daily newspaper. Already peeved over my midnight escapade, she'd be in a frightened twist to learn about a reporter in the garden. Florence was a dubious good luck charm but she was the only one present who might assist in escaping Charlotte's watchful eye. Do not hesitate, I told myself. Florence, I cried, are you going skating or have you been already? We are on our way now, said Florence, but I should first like to speak with the policeman. There is a plague upon us, Constable Beck put up his hands in mark, mock horror. Run for your lives, Torquay is being sworn by infant detectives. I would rather bathe in vinegar than become a detective, said Florence. I merely want to make a statement. <clears throat> Constable Beck made that familiar grunting sound. My brother was in the mermaid room on Saturday, Florence said. He was one of the last to see Mrs. Eversham alive. I believe we're aware of that, said Constable Beck. However, Florence went on, despite his failings as a brother, despite the fact that the Royal Victoria Hotel does indeed have a small rodent problem in the kitchen and a shelf full of vermarid, Despite what the newspaper has reported this very morning, here she paused to glare at me, here is my statement. Roddy Algernon Fuswell is not a murderer. Did she think that such a statement would settle the matter? That reporter was desperate to speak with me, Florence went on, but my father would not permit me being questioned. He said it would taint the hotel to have our name in a tawdry story about poison. Uh, thank you, Miss, uh, Constable Beck was trying to stem the flow. Fuss well, said Florence. I jumped in. Charlotte, will you be content if I skate with my friends and meet you afterward? Charlotte opened her mouth, but the policeman spoke first. I will be most agreeable to keeping you company, Miss Graves, he said. I am off duty in ten minutes. He brandished his pocket watch like a vital piece of evidence. Where is Miss Boyle? Charlotte looked about for the taciturn woman who usually accompanied Florence. She's fetching us Coco. Florence pointed toward the tea hut. Too bad you won't have one, Aggie. I held my breath, watching Charlotte choose the smitten policeman over circuits on the roller rink. One hour, Miss Aggie. We shall meet back on this spot, agreed? Florence clapped her gloves, gloved hands together. Wee! Wee? Florence was so difficult to read. One moment scalding in her rudeness, the next minute crying, wee! What was she hoping for in return for her false enthusiasm? I was very soon informed. Now, said Florence, once we'd moved out of Charlotte's hearing, before you tell me everything you know, allow me to confide how much you are despised by my father and my brother. The police went to, ho to the hotel, trilled Lavinia. Her father is furious because of the picture in the newspaper. My innards flipped over, giving me a very sick feeling. The hotel sugar bowl? For all the world to see? Shut your blithering mouth, Lavinia Payne, said Florence. This is my family and my hotel, not yours. Florence was gasping to be interviewed, but they only wanted to hear about Hush Vinny, said Florence. About Roddy and the missing money, said Lavinia. Lavinia Ethelwyn Payne, said Florence, curt and low. I will slap you silly if you say another word. From the hotel safe. Lavinia ducked away from her friend's swatting hand. This is her daydreaming. Florence looked as steamed as a runaway train, as spiky as a hot house cactus, as fierce as a stampeding rhinoceros, ready to erupt like a volcano. That has all been straightened out, said Florence, and is no one's business but my father's. Roddy will pay back what he borrowed, and he'll stop betting on dogs. On dogs who rip apart live rats for entertainment, said Lavinia. Lavinia, growled Florence. Fancy borrowing from your own family, said Lavinia, and being so stupid as to get caught. 
as this has nothing to do with Miss Marianne poisoning her sister-in-law, snapped Florence. I suggest you stop talking this instant. My heart, meanwhile, had sped up. Roddy was in debt from gambling. He'd taken money from the hotel safe. Hmm, exactly the sort of motive to, motive to inspire a murderous act. Did Rose know? I thought of Rose resting her head so trustfully against Roddy during the visitation. Was it trusting or just weary? Because how could someone like Rose care for someone like Roddy? I needed to get away from these girls and find Hector. I would tell one more fib. Oh dear, I pretended to search. Charlotte has my pocket money. No Leonard here to produce a sixpence from behind his ear. Don't bother about that, said Florence. Lavinia will pay for you, won't you, Vinny? You're paying for me, isn't that right? Since you can't keep your mouth shut when required. Lavinia nodded, but rolled her eyes. My mother does not like me to be beholden, I said. I'll find Charlotte. I'll meet you on the roller rink once you've had your cocoa. I hope you don't mind interrupting a slobbering kiss, said Florence. Your Charlotte was bug-eyed for that constable. More giggles from Lavinia. That was all I needed. Attention being paid to the new inconvenience of my nursemaid flirting with the policeman. If only just once I could toss out a clever retort to one of Florence Buswell's pin-sharp barbs. Clever retorts, in my experience, usually showed up a week later. Not alas, when they were needed. Back at the ramp to the Princess Pier, I turned frantically about. Psst! There, sitting on one of the ornate iron benches, Hector's bright eyes matched the color of his green hat, the one he'd acquired in the All Saints Bazaar. Infin, said Hector. Finally, I said. I've had to be awfully wily to get to this bench. So much deception is required simply to meet a friend. But our wiles have worked, and here we are. Alas, you find me shamed, said Hector. I'm hanging the head. Finding the paper dusted with sugar was now such a distant moment that I had forgotten to think that Hector might still be recovering. Don't be silly, I said. It was an understandable caution, and you were brave to take your clue to the police. His face showed a glimmer of gratitude, but then he shrugged. In this matter, I fail. We simply didn't think things all the way through, I said. Logically, I mean, the way you're usually so good at. Or we would have seen, unless the killer cared not one bit who the victim was and carried out a packet of poison to pour at any random moment into any available concoction. This does not seem practical, said Hector. This suggestion I disregard. I agree. So using the friction of my brain cells, I surmise that because the donation boxes were removed from the mermaid room before the murder happened, no evidence discovered inside them could have been put there after the murder. Hector grinned at me. You see the value of methodical deduction. However, I said, I have another clue. I presented the folded, folded letter. Hector was suitably respectful, holding it gingerly between trembling fingers. He raised his arched eyebrows even higher as he read, looking up with obvious excitement. Mon Dieu, he said, this is a new ball on the playing field. Yes, I breathed at last. I have someone to talk to. I've been bottled up like a jar of busy lemonade. I told him everything from the discovery of the letter in my notebook, right up to the midnight encounter with Constable Beck, omitting only how I had been clad at the time, which means she didn't tell him how little clothes she had on that she was just in her nightgown. I added my deduction that it was Miss Mary Ann who must have hidden the letter, Florence's reluctant admission of her brother's money woes, and Constable Beck's revelation that Mr. Fibley had been in the mermaid room on Saturday morning. I think that's everything, I said, except that I cannot decide whether Rose likes Roddy Fuswell or is only putting up with him. I had been speaking so rapidly that the pause here felt considerable. We listened to the hungry cries of seagulls and the faint flurry of piano notes from the roller rink. None of this seems to touch upon the letter I am holding, Hector said. But do you see? I pointed to the torn corner. We, oui, I see. This is evidently the source of the scrap for which the inspector is seeking, yes? I expect so, I said, and so, Hector tapped the paper several times with his fingertip. These few words are so critical to Madame Irma Eversham that she holds on even while she is dying. And so important to Miss Marianne, I said, that she tore the page from between the fingers of a dying woman and then hit it. I sighed from the bottom of my lungs. 
She must have been desperate to imagine that my notebook would keep a secret safe, even for a few hours. Hector put a comforting hand on my arm. I believe this is not proof that she is a killer, he said. The friction here, he touched his forehead, tells me that it may be proof that she is not. See another chapter. But lucky for you, I'm reading two chapters today. Chapter 20, A Furtive Encounter. How can an anonymous letter prove innocence or guilt? I said. This letter upsets both women, yes. We do not yet know the reason, but it compels both to act as they don't, do not normally act. Rose's mother comes, as never before, to visit Miss Marianne in the mermaid room, and I saw it once. And Miss Marianne conceals a clue that may be essential to finding a killer. We, too, are hiding the same clue, Hector reminded me. It is time. Do you agree to consult the police? No, I cried. They think Miss Marianne is guilty of murder. This might be a clinching factor. We need to protect her at least until we know why she hid the letter. Is she in need of your protection? Said Hector. It appears she is already protecting herself. Or someone else, I said. Hmm. We must look carefully at the cast of characters in the mermaid room on Saturday morning. Not every one of them wished Mrs. Eversham dead. But one of them does, said Hector. One most particularly wants her dead, and promptly. He withdrew from his pocket a small notebook half the size of my own and held a pencil ready. Which one is it? Who benefits now that Irma Eversham is dead? I wiggled on the bench. Rose would be the first choice, I said. She likely inherits buckets of money and gets rid of a nasty mother. But Rose never went to the mermaid room on Saturday. Her alibi is as firm as bricks. Unless she has a lethal accomplice willing to commit this most terrible act. I don't think she even likes Roddy Fuswell. Why would she trust him to murder her mother? Let's not be narrow-minded. It wasn't Rose or her aunt. We need to consider other suspects, whatever their likelihood at first glance. I am not ready to put aside Miss Rose, said Hector, but I am willing to consider Mr. Fuswell with full attention. You think someone else beyond these two? What if Rose's mother learned that Mr. Teasdale is not really a vicar at all, but a jewel thief in disguise who steals from old ladies in the All Saints congregation? He has amassed a fortune in pearls and rubies, but Mrs. Eversham discovered his cash in the alms box. He was forced to silence her in order to protect his reputation. Hector's eyebrows looked a little. This is not a logical conclusion from the facts we, that we have. Or perhaps, I said, Mrs. Eversham fell in love with Mr. Augustus Fibley and would not leave him in peace. She followed him everywhere, pleading that he relent and take her for his bride. Finally, he cracked, luring her to her death under the piano so that he could print the sordid details in the Torquay voice. Hector sighed. You are mocking me, I think. But we must be serious in the face of a letter such as this. The exposure of a secret is announced. A secret so great that no signature can be attached. He folded the paper and gave it back to me. I tucked it carefully into my left roller skate, somewhat chastened by his scolding. After a moment of silence, or silent consideration, Hector said, We must answer three questions. One, I said, who wrote the letter? Two, said Hector, to whom it is written. And three, who is the mysterious baby? I said, three questions of who? A small boy went past clutching his mother's skirt with one hand and holding a toy trumpet to his lips with the other. Black, black. I would like to be a spider for an hour, I said. It is the spider's good fortune to see the world from eight different directions. Would that not be useful while detecting? Every possibility could be considered. Back. This is the trumpet that's making the terrible noise. Equal consideration of eight views is wasting the time, said Hector. Most points of view can be ignored. We need only logic to tell us where to look next. We must ask who is most easily tainting the sugar. Well, that's easy. Roddy Fuswell was king of the sugar bowls, and no one looked twice, and he wants Rose to be rich. All her money would become his if they got married. He could pay his debts without stealing anything more from his family. We are in accord. I will commence the watching of Mr. Fuswell, he said. What will you do? Rose is meant to, to be coming to tea. Although the will has not yet been read, I will be watchful for any sign that Granny Jane's stern look darted through my mind. It wouldn't do to ask directly, I said, but Mr. Stanfast may slip up and give a hint 
of her expectations. This is good. Hector adjusted the collar of his sailor jacket so that it lay smoothly over his shoulders. I go now to the Royal Victoria Hotel. You know how to get there? I pointed across the harbor to the stately building that perched atop the cliffs beyond sun. I'm not trying to think. Okay. Sun sparkled on the water, reflecting flashes of light as if stars floated just beneath the waves. I see it, said Hector. From here, you must go the whole way around the harbor. I said, at the foot of the cliff, there's a path that goes down to the ladies' bathing cove. That's where I go swimming all summer. But you will take the road up the hill, not the path down to the cove. And if I were a bird, I would be there in a minute, said Hector. I am not discouraged by the distance. Today is Tuesday. Let us meet again on Thursday on this same bench. But be discreet if you see Charlotte or Constable Beck. I shall avoid Monsieur Beck wherever we may encounter. I am not at ease with those who consider me foolish, said Hector. I go now. Excuse me, Florence Festival's voice pierced the breezy air. Is this boy bothering you? He looks rather foreign. Florence, with Lavinia peering over her shoulder, spoke loudly and slowly. Are you foreign? Oui, mademoiselle, said Hector, making a small bow. I am quite foreign. The intruders inhaled in unison. <gasps> Lavinia's eyes so wide that she looked like a startled owl. May I, may I introduce Hector Perot, I said. Miss Lavinia Payne and Miss Florence Fuswell. Florence is the sister of Mr. Roddy Fuswell of the Royal Victoria Hotel. Ah, said Hector. I do not think being Roddy's sister is much of a, con con much of a commendation, Florence said, since he is an arrogant worm. Or should you say dog, asked Lavinia. But you are worthy in your own name, said Hector, for which I must give thanks. You are the girls who dance for friendship with the foreigners, yes? As you have so astutely noted, I am a foreigner and now the owner of a fine pair of new shoes. He lifted his right foot and pointed a shiny black toe. Lavinia giggled, but Florence eyed him suspiciously. We danced, she said, and we also provided the refreshments. Guineas worth of cakes and biscuits. It would not have been a successful event without the Royal Victoria Hotel. Did you provide also the sugar in the sugar bowl, mademoiselle? Florence's mouth dropped open and then snapped shut. If you've nothing better to do than make slanderous remarks, you should probably go straight back to France, she said. It is not permitted to bother girls on piers, not in England. I shall summon Miss Boyle to assist. It is permitted to speak with a friend, I said quickly before Florence could disturb her nursemaid, who was poking the pointy nib of a parasol at a seagull on the boardwalk, which is what he is, a friend of mine. A friend who is now saying farewell, said Hector. His eyebrows did a small caper, telling me goodbye, and as of this moment, I am a dedicated sleuth, and also, beware, look over your left shoulder. He bowed once more and slid away as I turned to find Charlotte trotting along the pier, lifting her skirt several inches above her ankles to prevent better mobility. So he was trying to let, uh, he was trying to tell uh, Aggie that Charlotte was on her way, right? There you are, Charlotte, I said. Hello, girls, she said. Good afternoon, Miss Boyle. Miss Boyle nodded a brusque greeting while using her parasol to indicate a jumble of bags on a bench across the pier. Your skating gear, ladies, is to be carried by you. Come along. She marched away, but Florence and Lavinia made no move to follow. I'm glad you're ready, Miss Aggie, said Charlotte briskly. Did you manage to remain upright on the rink? Her hour, her, her hour was most upright, said Florence. I wished to clamp my mouth over her mouth and hold it there. If she said, sitting rather too cozily on a bench with a foreign boy, could be considered upright. Oh no, because Charlotte doesn't like that, right? Lavinia snorted a laugh, and Charlotte turned to stare at me. If Charlotte consulted with Miss Boyle, my absence on the rink would be discovered within seconds. Aren't we rather late for tea, Charlotte? I said. Thanks to your appointment with the constabulary, I paused to let her cheeks go pink. We have a long walk ahead, as Leonard is not here to fetch us. Goodbye, everyone. Ladies, Miss Boyle was calling. I speared Florence with a furious glare and set off toward the strand, taking the longest steps I could manage. Charlotte caught up, panting slightly, 
Was Florence referring to Hector? She said, or have you sprouted a wider acquaintance with foreign boys in the last few hours? You are most particularly instructed not to. Would you have me rudely ignore a poor foreign person when he says good afternoon? I said, that would be most uncivil. <sighs> Saying good afternoon does not require sitting on a bench, said Charlotte. What would your mother say? Really? What would my mother say if she knew where you spent your hour? Because remember, she was supposed to be, she's like the babysitter. She's not supposed to leave Aggie, but she stayed with the policeman, right? Charlotte stopped walking right in the middle of the pavement. Oh, Miss Aggie, that's blackmail. So easy to slip into a life of crime, I thought. Arrest in mermaid room murder, hollered a newsboy. Penny for the paper, read all about it, cried another boy from the opposite corner. Mermaid killer caught. Oh. I think they've got the killer. But it's the end of chapter 20. <laughs>